Next, we have a talk um, from Pixel to Point, a story of data annotation labor, in which Cindy Kane Ling explores data annotation labor, dealing with how ground truth has shaped and has been shaped by transnational exchanges of mapping, particularly between Southeast Asia and the US. In this talk, she shows how machine learning in environmental mapping doesn't just mechanically replicate human expertise, but uh, seeks to supersede or devalue expertise in areas such as environmental science and cartography. And this devaluation of manual classification doesn't just devalue, it arguably replaces it with new algorithmic ways of knowing and governing the environment and producing what we might call the real. Um, so I'd just like to introduce you to Cindy. So Cindy Kailing is a postdoctoral fellow at the Cornell Atkinson Center for Sustainability, where she's currently working on a book project that's examining ground truth within the history of machine learning as a shifting political and scientific category. So please join me in welcoming Cindy Kainling. Hi, Cindy. Hi, hi, Rachel. So nice to see you. Um, do you hear me well? Is there no echo? No, we can hear you really well. Okay, great. I'm just going to share my screen right now. Go ahead. Hi, everyone. I am Cindy Lin. Thanks for attending this talk. Um, I'd first like to thank the organizers and curators of Transmutalay and the wonderful technical team and staff members who are maintaining the infrastructure of this symposium. I'm speaking to you from the ancestral and unceded territory of the Lenape people of present day New York City. Today, I want to return to an article I wrote for EFLUX Architecture close to two years ago called How to Make a Forest. In particular, I aim to elaborate on the labor of geospatial data technicians and how they approach the practice of ground truth. The term ground truth has been first used and popularized by the remote sensing community for half a century. It refers to how data collected remotely or at a distance are confirmed by measurements on the ground. The term is spread across disciplines, notably in machine learning, where it has come to entail human validated data sets used to train and supervise predictive models. These definitions of ground truth suggest that human interpretation can be used to evaluate the accuracy of what's observed at a distance, or in the instance of machine learning, to assess the accuracy of a predicted output with various statistical measures. For this talk, I centered the role of ground truth in mapping and how this practice has recently started to incorporate data science techniques. I draw from ethnographic fieldwork I've done in Indonesia with geospatial data technicians and data scientists who were tasked to remap the nation. In the manual mapping and surveying of landscapes, the visual interpretation of geospatial data technicians is regarded as a major source of error, even though the burden of creating an accurate map largely fell on them. Because the concept of ground truth presumes that ground measurements had the least uncertainty error was both understood as derived from and made resolvable by data annotators such as these technicians. Such impulses to discipline error is not new. They are a result of the 20th century rise of statistical thinking and probabilistic reasoning where errors do not need to be eliminated but tame in advance. When deep learning is deployed to map land, the focus was on how to break down interpretive skills into mechanizable tasks. The result is to make a well-defined task perform reliably and with efficiency. Here, errors are retrospectively integrated to enhance the performance of the model without explanation of its internal operations. There are hence important differences between manual mapping and mapping with machine and deep learning. The former relies on assessing the accuracy of maps according to ground collected data, where a sample based approach allows a careful interpretation of specific areas of a map. The latter also relies on comparing classification results to additional ground truth information, except that ground truth in machine and deep learning operates at a third order remove from ground to pixel to point. 
The talk makes two arguments. First, it shows how the use of machine learning in environmental mapping is therefore not just a mechanical attempt to re replicate human expertise, but also a kind of how domain fields such as the environmental sciences and cartography is being devalued and rearranged in a hierarchy of professional expertise. This evaluation has already made gateway in the practice of deep learning, where a reduced dependency on human labelers is explicitly promoted by computer scientists. Second, and perhaps more speculatively, the devaluation of manual classification has installed a new way of knowing and governing the environment based on an ascending order of abstraction, even as it seeks to import the legitimacy of direct witnessing as seen in the invocation of the shifting figure of ground truth. I'll first begin this talk by discussing how state scientists aim to narrow down and mitigate sources of error committed by geospatial data technicians. Second, I'll briefly discuss recent efforts to de integrate deep learning techniques into mapping in Indonesia. And lastly, the talk ends with a key insights into how data science has transformed how we relate to the world and how this pertains to definitions of ground truth. In pursuit of a zero error map. There are three main ways of rendering forest knowledge into maps. The first was shown to me by Munir, a 23-year-old high school educated data technician hired by a private geospatial company in Bandung, an urban provincial capital on the island of Java, Indonesia, to produce topographic maps. He is one of a team of technicians working under subcontracts from the National Mapping Agency to draw squares and rectangles around vast swaths of building and property across the archipelago. Sitting with Munir, I noticed him drawing at pixels instead of satellite images. Scaled to 1 is to 25,000, Munir uses his mouse to quickly click and draw a parameter around what I learned are roofs. The roofs are located in Tamajuk, a coastal city on the island of Kalimantan, a region that has witnessed the world's fastest forest clearing rates since 2012, as the oil palm sector has expanded across rural Indonesia. I asked Munir why not zoom in, thinking that this will ensure his clicks are made with more precision so that nothing is missed. He tells me, quote, my boss wants us to work fast, end quote. He then explains that zooming in would give him and his colleagues too much to work with. Even if state agency scientists demand that every building is drawn, his supervisors are afraid that the technicians will interpret too much. Every minute in their office facilities, on the computers and software counts for a pool of technicians paid far too little to meet the agency's ambition for an archipelago to be remapped. During regular three month long field surveys to plantation frontiers like Tamajuk, Munir and his colleagues cross referenced the maps they plotted in the office. The exploited terrain poses a danger to the visiting technicians as they tread on eroded and restricted hills, succumb to dislocated knees, and negotiate diffuse threats of death and injury. This work is not easy. Both of them are, most of them are paid 3 million rupiah or US 200 monthly four times below the average income of average income in Bandung. Munir shrugged when I asked about his rages, reasoning that maps are crucial for Indonesia's Pembangunan, or in, in English language, development, an ever-shifting ideology that has haunted the nation since its plans for self-sufficiency began in the 1950s. Yet Munir and his fellow technicians insisted that opportunity resides in their desk work and field surveys as direct participants in state forestry protection. The technician's remediation of pixels provides this lower class man, migrants from rural Indonesia to urban Bandung, a mobility and positionality otherwise out of reach. The remapping project emerged from an earlier incident in December 2010, when former Indonesian administration compared two conflicting maps of Papua Island. The two forest maps showed primary forests of different sizes and boundaries. Researchers attributed this error to different forest classifications and mapping methods. To ameliorate this error, the administration hired teams of earth scientists and geospatial data technicians like Munir to accelerate the remapping of Indonesia's 18,309 islands. This, since 2016, this acceleration also included a suite of data science techniques and remote sensing data to expedite the remapping process. 
state scientists in the National Mapping Agency believe that this new techniques and data could remove two errors typically committed by data technicians. Positional errors and attribute errors. Positional errors are inaccurate coordinates of drawn boundaries. Attribute errors are misclassified features, names, and descriptions. The operation of reducing errors practiced by data technicians was made clear to me when we were taught how to see at the technical office in Bandung. Working through a montage of green and brown, Munir commented, quote, when the brown pixel changes into a green pixel, what you see is the age of a forest in the beginning of a house. You try your best to draw a square, but always a little forest near the house will escape. Quote. His earlier trace was return in red, marked as incorrect by the National Mapping Agency. Quote, they want us to draw every house, but I can hardly see them without zooming in. And if I zoom in, I will never finish this map in time. I will never be paid, end quote. Munir agonized over the deadline set by the National Mapping Agency. He has spent hours determining which pixel makes the cut. Perhaps drawing in this green pixel matches the vegetation nearby. Perhaps adding in a brown pixel will result in more property for the house owner. A single pixel had that much power. Munir's classifications contribute to a single base map of Indonesia, a standardized reference for other government ministries to further distinguish forest classes into, for instance, primary and secondary forests. Hence, if Munir classified, say, 20 pixels as a forest, the Ministry of Environment and Forestry would use the same pixels to further classify and map distinct forest classes. Munir was afraid to commit an attribute error, given that the international scientific community and environmentalists have testified against the Ministry of Environment and Forestry for doctoring national forest maps, largely to reflect a higher estimate of total forest count. Munir's fear is further exacerbated by the National Mapping Agency's stringent mapping standard. For maps greater than 1 is to 20,000, the tolerance for error is 0.8 millimeter on the scale of a map. A slight inclusion of half a pixel into a forest class can be regarded as inaccurate. If technicians make small scale maps of Indonesia, they will classify batches of pixels. But because they were making large scale, high resolution maps, their classifications had to be accurate to the millimeter. Technicians had to classify pixel by pixel. In cases where two different landscape classes, such as forest and field, are found in a single pixel, compromises are made. Technicians will coordinate with their colleagues to decide what class the pixel belonged to. All the while, they're reminded that an extra pixel adds at least five meters to the total calculated area of any land feature, posing a serious challenge to Indonesia's mapping agency in their bid to reach for zero error mapping. In addition to attributional errors, technicians have to resolve positional errors during field surveys. This involves surveying points that are randomly sampled by state scientists and validating the land class coordinates and names of these places. Surveys also included patient consultation with village leaders on where public facilities are located. In 2017, we followed Munir on a field survey to search for three points plotted on a satellite image of Tamaju that had been taken earlier in 2015. These three points were plotted to confirm the land class of a forest. Munir told me that we have to be careful, given that the points were plotted from Jakarta by state scientists who have mostly looked at Kalimantan from above. Halfway into our journey, we got lost into the take of Borneo's forest dew and sludge. Munir's navigator stopped working with his GPS point moving wildly with every step we took. Local residents had earlier warned us that we were already trespassing into the concession areas of a German timber logging company and that we would be in grave danger if spotted. Munir refused to stop his search and returned to camp. Quote, I have to find this point. The mapping agency wants to know if this is a forest or a field. I don't want to delay our team. End quote. We continue. Munir finally paused at what appeared to be a clearing with taller trees on either side of the field. We all sighed in relief. But the clouds were getting heavier. We did not want to get lost. Our guide told us to get out quickly. At the very moment where we thought we were a step closer to the truth, Munir's navigator received a signal again. 
We were further away from the point plotted by Jakarta state scientists. The right location was across a creek. Row it for our safety, Munir marked where we were on his navigator, mumbling, quote, this would do for now, end quote. In situations where it's difficult both from afar and on the ground to tell where a forest began and where a field ended, technicians showed how living with errors was inherent in the making of an accurate map. From pixel to point. So far, I've talked about how forest maps were made by data technicians who classified pixel by pixel and conducted treacherous field surveys. The second was based on the precision of points produced by remote sensing technology called light detection and ranging data, or LIDAR. LIDAR comprises three features, intensity values, elevation values, and a return number, recorded from a remote sensing device fitted to an airplane or satellite. These values are compiled into a 3D data point cloud that's unlike a flat 2D pixelated satellite image, emphasizing features that can't be observed from plain sight. Jakarta, July 2018. I'm sitting in front of a laptop opened by Pfizer, a civil servant and trained geographer working for the National Mapping Agency, one year after my field survey with Munir. Further contrasting the point cloud to a pixel, he told me that LIDAR can help technicians to think less and map faster. Quote, unlike a point cloud, which intuition would tell you to join together based on the proximity of dots, a single pixel gives too much information. Pixels make an operator imagine too much, end quote. It is believed that by using LIDAR as the base in which technicians can differentiate ground from non-ground features, such as forests and buildings, Mapping can be sped up. Instead of drawing lines around pixels to classify building and property reserve, technicians now draw proximate dots. According to Pfizer, LiDAR point cloud can speed up mapping because of two factors. First, from an area satellite imagery, technicians are now able to see through forest cover. LiDAR could penetrate the gaps of forest branches and leaves to spot a road, river, or building that lay underneath. Second, technicians could use the elevation value of each LIDAR point to classify features according to mapping standards. Since each LIDAR point had the elevation value of any object, technicians can calculate height and decide if the dense plot of trees he or she or they were looking at was indeed a forest. For instance, in Indonesia, forest cover is defined as an area of trees with more than 5 meters in height, more than 30 meters percentage in canopy cover and excludes plantations such as oil palm. Despite this newfound numerical position, technicians were only tasked to smooth the elevation values of the LIDAR point cloud to make a good digital elevation model, a necessary component of large-scale maps. Raw elevation models made from LIDAR have minor variations and noise, and it was the job of technicians to smooth this out. Back in Bandung, Munir told me he no longer stared hard at pixels. Instead, he consistently clicked and dragged his mouse to highlight a cluster of data points, average their elevation values, and erase outstanding ones. For the mapping agency in Jakarta, this helped the state to create order amidst the complexities of the world. It molded consistency into land, like the repetitive and time actions of the data technicians. Seized by frustration, Munir felt he was completing media tasks instead of classification. Quote, a machine needs to do my job, end quote. He looked at me from his screen. It is an inefficient use of time. While the smoothing out of point cloud was previously automated, the National Mapping Agency insisted that operators have to manually average elevation points this year. The use of LIDAR in national maps was new, so state scientists were concerned that any errors made with automated classification cannot be easily identified and corrected. With technicians, such contingencies can be managed and controlled. While technicians have placed time, energy, and risk to reduce errors, supervisors believe that their work was too slow. One of Munir's supervisors confirmed this, commenting that technicians have hands and eyes that are meant to work fast without thought. As such, the use of LIDAR only served to devalue the work of manual classification as nearly automatic, requiring no real presence of mind or cognitive attention. 
The alleged mindlessness of technicians was made apparent to me one day when Munir's supervisor had hired geography graduates to interpret and lightly marked out rice fields, leaving the work of, pre work of pre precise outlining and delineating to technicians. In this way, expertise is located at the point of identification, while the decision to make an exact cut across pixels is regarded as a mere mechanical act. A different kind of ground truth. The third way of map making, each an additional step away from ground observation, involved incremented efforts to devalue technicians' expertise. This referred to the application of deep learning techniques in state map making contracts. Bayou, a university educated earth scientist from the National Mapping Agency in Jakarta, has developed a method to transform a 3D LiDAR point cloud into 2D pixel based images. These images are what Bayou then used to train a fully convolutional network, or FCN, to classify point clouds into different features, such as trees and buildings. Ironically, while technicians allegedly saw too much in pixels, Bayou's FCN model returned to pixels to categorize points. Extracted from LiDAR, these pixel images also act as the ground truth for Bayou to calibrate future outputs from his model. Bayou trained his model with two assumptions. First, a building surface comprised of LiDAR data points with similar elevation values. That is, all roofs had a similar height. Second, a building's edges had points that do not have neighboring points on all of its sides. His model then loops around these pre-given parameters such that it outlined the edge points of a building by itself. Bayou's model attempts to mimic how data technicians draw boundaries by using heuristics such as if LiDAR points have higher and similar values, they represent non-ground features such as roof surfaces. Distinguishing ground from non-ground at the level of every pixel, his model is considered by its superiors as more precise than how technicians classify. Bayou's work was so precise that his FCM model was considered erroneous when a lighter point belonging to a tree branch was classified as roof, given that the branch was just above a building roof. <clears throat> Observations that are meaningless to technicians, such as the branch that lies above the building roof, have huge implications on the error rates of Bayou's FCM model. Unlike technicians who coordinated their vision with other technicians and ventured into the field to calibrate their judgment, Bayou's model relied purely on the performance of its model in order to improve its prediction. Models that infer patterns and optimize its performance based on error rates like Bayou's deep learning technique resemble what computing scholar Dan McQuillan calls machinic neoplatonism. Neoplatonic approaches to science aim to reveal the hidden mathematical order in the world and go against experience. Bayou models what's out there with traces of experience, the point that can be quantified and computed in skills that exceed human apprehension. In Bayou's case, a model is designed to be the optimal technician, yet it challenged what he could see and know. Quote, it's just a black box, he told me. He could only verify the model's output value against the ground truth image. During one workshop, Bayou realized that his FCN network had failed to classify features unique to Indonesia, in part owing to the model's training data being generated from urban Muslim Europe. He attempted to add more object classes to the ground truth image, and this included uncleared land and waste, categories informed by his living in Jakarta, a metropolis well known to be heavily polluted. The addition of this label led to huge increases in classification accuracy. What was erroneous here in terms of training data was immediately redressed, fed back to the model and iterated upon. As historian of science Matthew Jones writes, the practices of machine learning stem, quote, more from an engineering culture of predictive utility than from a scientific culture of truth, end quote. If predictive utility faces any need for causal explanation, Bayou's field of ground truth is of a very different kind than Winnie's. Conclusion. In sum, I've made two main arguments. First, the use of advanced remote sensing and deep learning techniques has rendered mapping as a mindless endeavor in Indonesia. Second, the devaluation of mapping as mindless legitimizes an abstracted way of knowing forest life with implications on data annotation labor and definitions of ground truth. To elaborate my first argument, the mapping labor of data technicians was regarded as mechanical through tree transitions in map making. 
Traditionally, mapping involved the manual classification and field surveys conducted by technicians. Because there was a need to produce a zero error, high resolution, large scale map in order to resolve a crisis of legitimacy in forest management, data technicians had to follow stringent mapping standards and calibrate their judgment during field surveys. With an increased emphasis on cost cutting and speed in the National Mapping Agency, LIDAR data was used. The scope of technicians' interpretive space was further reduced, make evident through their reassignment as mindless operators that merely smoothed elevation values instead of making classification decisions. With the demotion of technicians' mapping expertise as mechanical, deep learning can now be implemented to draw national maps without having to explain how this is done. Indeed, as Harry Collins has argued, machines can now can only achieve the appearance of intelligence in sectors where people, like these technicians, have already disciplined themselves to be sufficiently machine-like. Second, and perhaps more speculatively, deep learning invites an abstracted way of knowing the world, especially when it imports the legitimacy of direct witnessing as invoked through the shifting figure of ground truth. What I mean by an abstracted way of knowing is how ground truth in deep learning rely on the conversion of ground to pixel to points as a surface for validating an output. With the use of deep learning models that rely on LIDAR point cloud as a source of ground truth, errors made by a predictive model were no longer meaningful to humans. Instead, errors are used to further tune the predictive accuracy of the model with most of its internal states opaque to Bayou himself. Operating at a third order remove, deep learning models become legitimate precisely because ground is converted into points which are then fed into models and in turn labor points anew, points feed points. Unlike the field survey, ground truth is found within the image in data science, not in the forest. Deep learning models can hence predict that a forest is present, but do not offer any explanation of why that's the case, restricting the forms of accountability they can afford. You might now ask, so what? Why does it matter that industry of geospatial data technicians is regarded as doing mindless work? So what if the pursuit of ground truth is increasingly reliant on the ascending order of abstraction? I'll answer these two questions accordingly. First, the devaluation of manual classification joins a broader computing effort to treat quality data annotation as an unnecessary feature of data science and computer vision. In a recent 2019 blog post made by the Stanford AI lab blog, data and computer scientists narrowed down the bottleneck in machine and deep learning models as a reliance of these models on quote, hand-labored training data. They argue that these hand-labored training data sets or data annotations are expensive and time-consuming, especially when domain experts such as remote sensing scientists or medical professionals are needed for annotation. Because of these, ML and deep learning practitioners have turned towards weaker forms of supervision, which includes using small sets of labored data or low quality labored data from non-experts, relying on heuristics created by domain experts or fine tuning pre-trained models previously used in a different geography and domain. This meant that domain experts are no longer integral to the making of accurate data science models, but a dispensable component. Hence, the mechanization of mapping is just a prelude to what has already been advocated within data science communities the displacement of domain knowledge with programmable forms of data annotation is worth noting. Furthermore, the growing prominence of weak supervision further segregates the work of data collection and analysis. Where the former has astutely observed early on by philosopher Paulan Hotan Jing, largely performed by natives and colonies. Indeed, much of the data annotation work performed today are carried out by refugees and Global South subcontracted workers. Second, the problem of abstraction in deep learning from ground to pixel to point forces us to reckon with the shifting figure of ground truth and the cost such transformations evolve. In the 2021 article written by geoscientist Ian Woodhouse at the University of Edinburgh, Woodhouse urges that the remote sensing community should give up ground truth. He argues that ground truth quote primes and predisposes our students to believe that the right answer, the most truthful one, is the one that's measured on the ground, but not the one measured on the distance. End quote. Woodhouse elaborates that on occasion, remote sensing provides a better measurement as opposed to field surveys. For example, in the case of Farrow's forest canopy height of soil moisture, measurements can, cannot be taken directly from the ground and only can be extracted from satellite imagery. 
But in the same article, Woodhouse advocates to relocate ground truth by decentering the human skill as a default skill by which we interrogate the nature of our planet, adding that ecologists have proposed the use of a macroscope that will represent the biosphere of the entire planet in an unbiased skill. This argument shows how Woodhouse is convinced that a better understanding of the planet means erasing the human, with humans being the main source of bias. Perhaps it's worth considering the similarities between Woodhouse's proposal to relocate ground truth on a macro scale of form, the bias abstracted form of ground truth in deep learning. Both consider a more precise measurement of ground truth is provided by remote sensing instruments such as the macroscope and LIDAR, both aim to get rid of field surveys and human bias, both advocate to skill up Woodhouse's microscope, take on the planetary skill and bias model to be optimized through testing against other data sets. Yet, doing so seems to leave intact the idea that error can be resolved through technical means. Unlike in technicians' work where there's a realist impulse to uncover the truth on the ground, in deep learning, error is identified only as missing the mark. If missing the mark means abandoning the human skill like Woodhouse suggests, it gives up what feminist and post-colonial technoscience scholars have long argued. All credible knowledge are constituted by one's partial privileged perspective, which includes one gender, racial, class, national, and cultural difference. So while I empathize with Woodhouse's view that there is a fetish with ground truth or observation, whether mediated through a microscope or a GPS navigator, are not neutral, but theory-laden, highly material, and political act. Maybe a way forward is to consider how giving up ground truth is not so much to decenter the human, but to embrace an artful living with error. As data technicians such as Munir have shown us, living with error does not stick to absolutes, but considers the contingency of everyday life and encounter. Here, error does not hinder knowledge production, nor does it serve as an aberration to what should be deemed normal. Instead, it shows us what Munir has told me a few years back in Borneo to Maju. This would do for now. Thank you very much. <laughs>